I vividly remember the day that Princess Diana died. I got the news early Sunday morning, went to church. Church was weird that Sunday. The song leaders did their best, but the congregation was just dazed. I know that my sermon did not hit the mark. We made some adjustments to the service, including, of course, because praying for Diana's family, but it just wasn't enough. We underestimated the emotional significance of the event. Perhaps you've been in a situation like that yourself. Now, back in the 90s when that happened, I, I find that we could forgive ourselves because we were all young, inexperienced, and we didn't know any better. However, the events of that day are burned into my mind, not least because I learned the significance of context regarding public worship. In other words, meaningful collective worship is not simply about what you do. It's about how you think about what you are doing, including the context. And that's what we're going to explore today. So hello, I'm Malcolm Cox. This is teaching tip number 375. This is the second in the series on hosting Sunday worship. Last time we talked about hosting and the New Testament and aims of worship. Today, we're going to look a bit more at, I suppose, what you might call general guidance. And by the way, guidance is just what it says. It's guidance, not rules. I'm not giving out rules here. And this guidance applies now in 2024 for me and the congregation where I'm based in Watford. And these guidelines will doubtless need to be updated in the future. They can and should be changed as needs dictate. Our guidelines should change, so should yours. No local practices are permanent. Only the word of God never changes, right? First Peter 1, 24, 25, all people are like grass, including their guidelines, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, the guidelines become outdated, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So with those thoughts in mind, let's go on to talk about six issues of general guidance. Number one, context we've already talked about. So what we do and say on any given Sunday should be affected by things like the time of year, like Christmas, Easter, and so on. It's affected by special days, if it's Remembrance Sunday or Father's Day, Mother's Day, that kind of thing. It's affected by things like if we have a visiting speaker and also unexpected events like the death of Princess Diana, could be the outbreak of war somewhere, could be damaged, damage in your community because of freak weather, I don't know, all kinds of things should affect what we do and how we do it on a Sunday. Think about it. Paul's lesson in Pisidian Antioch in Acts 13 is very different from his presentation in Athens in Acts chapter 17. And why are they so different? It's the same gospel, right? But they're so different because the cultures and religious contexts of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and of Greece, they're very different. Context affects not only sermons, but also prayers and songs. For example, a song of lament would be appropriate when there's been a, a death in the congregation, for example, and also the other elements of the service. By the way, Jesus uh, set his teaching in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, in the context of recent events. So the context affected his teaching. Have a look at it. John, uh, sorry, Luke 13, 1 to 5. Firstly, context. Secondly, attitude. I'm going to just recap briefly here what I said about hosting last time. In general, those speaking on a Sunday will want to have the attitude of a host. The early church, as we know, probably met in homes most of the time. So it was natural for the head of the house to be the host. For example, at Romans 16 verse 23, Gaius, host to me and the whole church, greets you. Good hosts do not make themselves the center of attention, but have the interests of their guests in mind and do their best to ensure things run smoothly so that people are not distracted from the purpose of the gathering. Attitude matters, and I think hosting is a good perspective. Thirdly, connections. I'm talking here about connections between parts of the service. You stand up to do something. What's just happened? and what's about to happen when you're done with your bit. So when it's your turn to speak, do your best to connect with what has just happened 
and what's going to happen next. This makes a big difference to the congregation being able to follow along with what's happening and to stay engaged. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say some singing has just finished. You might be getting up to say a few words of welcoming everybody, and then perhaps someone is going to come and pray. So what you might want to do when you get up is before you get into your spiel about what you want to say, you might say, that song we sang really helped me because, or helped me to, there's maybe a phrase in the song that you were connected to that meant something to you. Just take 20 seconds to say that, then go in to talk about what you're going to talk about, and then link to the next thing. So if it was, say, someone coming up to pray, you might say, and now... Sarah is going to lead us in prayer. So it's not, I've done my welcome, I sit down, the next thing happens. It's what's happening next. Of course, you need to know what's happening next. So find out before you, preferably before you get there on Sunday, but at least on Sunday morning when you get there. This song helped me because now Sarah is going to lead us in prayer. Connections help avoiding, help to us to avoid a disjointed service. And it's harder to stay engaged when you're sitting in row Z if what's being done now hasn't got any connection with what's just happened. There must be a connection. So connections can make a big difference. Next thing we'll look at here is themes. It's good practice for people leading parts of the service to find out in advance if there's a theme for the service that day. And if so, it helps if all of us doing our bits and pieces, if we can fit our sharing, our praying and so on into that theme. For example, let's say the theme is the mercy of Jesus. So if the welcome, people, the people welcoming people, uh, the people praying, the lesson itself, the songs being sung, if they're all connected with mercy, or at least whether directly or tangentially, we in a congregation are all going to go home thoroughly sort of drenched in that biblical theme and that Christ-like characteristic. So elements could include things like the song, You Are Merciful to Me. You might include that. Or perhaps a prayer based on Psalm 51 verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. You see how adding in a prayer themed on mercy and a song themed on mercy, as well as a lesson on mercy, it's going to help us to go away with a clear a clear point, a clear idea of, of what that characteristic of Christ is really like. It's going to sink in more. And the lesson, for example, might be on the demoniac in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus tells the demoniac after he's been healed to go home to your own people, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. All these connections can help. Next point, avoiding the overload. Avoiding the overload. Now, perhaps you, like me, have experienced church services with several um, lessons. Uh, a lesson in the person from the person welcoming everybody, a lesson in the sermon, a lesson in the, let's say there was a, some sharing about Hope Worldwide, there's a lesson in there, a lesson in the communion talk. Sometimes even the prayers turn into a preaching opportunity for somebody while they pray. And I've got some thoughts on that and you'll see the footnote to an, uh, a linked article. The problem no matter how sincere each person has been in delivering their uh, lesson, is that all the hearers, we go away confused, we go away overloaded. So many lessons in such a short time cannot all be absorbed. They can be connected, but they just can't be all lessons. So as a general habit, it works best when the sermon or whatever the equivalent is for you of a sermon is the main lesson and the other parts of the service support or augment that lesson. And then let's go to preparation for our last point here. Preparation. Now there is a balance, it must be said, between informality and formality, between spontaneity and preparation. So we don't need a rule, but let's reflect on one uh, point from a passage here in 1 Corinthians 14.26, where Paul remarks about the Corinthian Christians when you come together, each of you has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. So all these Corinthians are coming to church with these things. Maybe they don't all have all of them, but they seem that lots of them have at least one of the things he's listing there. So we see that the members of the Corinthian church had prepared 
what they were bringing to the service. A hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. These were brought with them to the service. Now, I know the passage is descriptive, of course, not prescriptive. But it does speak to the value of thinking about what we will say or sing on the days leading up to the service. Preparation is no barrier to spontaneity or informality. You see, when you get up to speak, you can add to what you have prepared or you could change it. But some preparation is wise. And if nothing else, you can more fully participate in the worship before you speak. You do your part. If you're prepared, you can relax and just join in. You don't have to think about what you're about to say because you already know. So you can relax, you can listen to what's being said, you can pray, you can sing wholeheartedly before it's your turn to get up there. Indeed, I think you'll find it easier to incorporate anything relevant that's just happened before you step up to speak. Because if you're adding something to what you've already prepared, that's much better than trying to respond to something on the hoof without having prepared it. That having been said, we've always got to leave room for the Spirit to redirect us as he sees fit of course. So some questions for reflection and discussion if you're watching this with some friends. Where are you on the preparation spontaneity spectrum? The extremes are unhealthy. Over-preparation is a byproduct of controlling perfectionism and it leads to a deadness over-spontaneity, on the other hand, is a byproduct of indisciplined impulsivity and it leads to confusion. So what will help you to avoid the extremes? Ecclesiastes 7, 16 to 18. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Preparation and spontaneity can go together, but miss out either of them and you'll lose something. So to summarize, to wrap up, the six points I've given you spell um, CAC top, C-A-C-T-O-P. Now it's not catchy, I grant you, but could that acronym be useful, C A? C-T-O-P. The next time you're asked to do something public on a Sunday, why not run through CAC top, the CAC top points as a checklist and see if it improves your helpfulness to the congregation in whatever it is that you are going to be doing that Sunday. So finally, it's time for the challenge of the week. I wonder if you took last week's challenge. I hope you did. This week's challenge is the next time you lead in some form on a Sunday, whatever it is, singing, prayer, lesson, welcoming everybody, whatever it is, the next time you lead in some form on Sunday, pick one of the six points we've talked about from CAC Top and make it the focus of your preparation and notice what it does. Notice what you learn from doing that. Next time, we're going to start considering the details of preparing and presenting various specific parts of the service, starting with what is often called the welcome. And you will find out why I dislike that phrase. But that's for next time. So please add your comments on this week's topic. Leave it where we can see it so that we can learn from each other because we learn best when we're learning in community. If you have any questions about the Bible, drop me an email via the email address on screen. If you'd like a copy of my ebook on spiritual disciplines called how God Grows His People, then subscribe to my newsletter from my website and I'll look forward to connecting with you. Please pass the link on, subscribe and leave a review. Why not? And I remind you that whatever else is going on to keep calm and carry on teaching. Take care and God bless. <laughs>